Well, welcome to episode 72 of Silver Lining for Learning. Uh, we're very excited to be able to talk about STEM education today in and out of school. And I've been speaking on STEM education at a variety of conferences in the US and abroad, virtually speaking. And there is such a recognition now that STEM every single day it becomes more important because citizens are faced with making decisions about big data. Citizens are faced with not only making decisions about AI, but having to work in partnership with AI. And these are not phenomena that can be understood by firewalling away science, technology, engineering, and math and treating them separately. The whole point of thinking about STEM is the whole is more than the sum of the parts because the interrelationships are what really give the multidisciplinary understanding. And I'm so happy to have uh, two guests who can help us understand how to get STEM education moving faster and transformatively. So M. Mary Jo M.J. Mata uh, was a, a student at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. She arrived knowing an incredible amount, and we tried to add a little during the time that she was there. She'll talk about some of the different careers that she's had, even though she's relatively young. And she's now uh, doing doctoral work at UCLA, as well as working with Google. And Chelsea Roebuck, uh, has a degree in mechanical engineering, which is near and dear to my heart because my younger daughter, I hope in one year, will have a degree in mechanical engineering. And um, he has worked to foster STEM learning, particularly in populations who've been marginalized by society, uh, both, both here and in Global South countries. And so, he has some really interesting experiences and he and MJ have worked together. So we've got guests that, that can play off of one another. So with that as an introduction, uh, MJ, tell us a little more about yourself and, and then tell us what you think is going on in STEM education right now that you're excited about. Absolutely. And thank you so much for having me, Chris slash Professor Didi. It's funny, I met with a sixth grader of mine from 2011 the other day, and she insisted on calling me Miss Mata. And now that I'm here in that same position with a former professor, I find it very hard to call him by his first name, uh, which is definitely making me chuckle. Um, well, uh, like Chris said, I did go to the Harvard Graduate School of Education, but prior to that, I had been a middle school math and uh, science teacher. And I also did some curriculum advising um, at the school that I was at. And um, part of that was going one-to-one -one with technology. And the, I won't give all the details, but it sort of became a bit of a mess. And so that I think has always driven a lot of what my interests have been moving forward is trying to better understand how technology fits into both informal and formal learning spaces. And so since I left um, graduate school, I spent four years as a journalist writing about education and technology for EdSurge. And while I was doing that, I interviewed the architect behind this space called Code Next, which is now who I work for at Google. And I was really fascinated and intrigued by the idea of having a live program in a building where Black and Latino Hispanic students could come after school on the weekends, really any time of the week um, to come get computer science training. And I met the team through that and basically the rest as they say is history. And I've been there now for four years um, and worked with the team to expand, not just the live labs that we have, but then also trying to see COVID as an opportunity to open up virtual versions of our programs into states from across the country. Um, which includes adding a, another targeted group, which is Native and Indigenous students to our, our um, targeted groups that Codenex works with. I came to meet Chelsea because Chelsea was part of uh, the Harlem Alliance, which was a group of partners that we worked with to create the Codenex Harlem Lab. And I'll, I don't want to take a shine, so Chelsea, I'll let you go through that. But 
um, you asked about STEM and the thing that is I'm most, most focused on right now is a lot related to the research that I'm doing for my dissertation work at UCLA, which is really focused on, are we adequately preparing black and brown students for the future of work? And I think the answer is very nuanced, but I'm hoping that during this conversation, we can talk about it because it's a very complicated situation, especially because of COVID. When you're thinking about the role of automation in specific communities, when you're thinking about, you know, these new and burgeoning arenas, e-commerce, um, cybersecurity, and really they're not new, but they're growing rapidly. I get concerned that I just don't see formal education addressing those things enough. And so I see informal learning as kind of picking up the slack until formal learning catches up. Um, but that could be the start of a long conversation. So I will pass it back to Chris or over to Chelsea. Chelsea, yeah. let's go to you and um, t tell us about your your journey. Sure. So uh, my background is in mechanical engineering, as as a as as Chris mentioned in the introduction, um, but I think that my heart has always been in education. Um, I come from a family of educators. My mom, my grandmother were both educators. And so, um, you know, growing up when I wasn't in school, I was in school with my mom. Um, and I think, you know, it, it, it was just sort of this incredible experience to constantly be in learning spaces and, and um, you know, asking questions and thinking critically. And I think that's one of the reasons why uh, I naturally gravitated to uh, engineering because I, I liked understanding how things worked. I liked understanding how the world works. Um, ultimately, when I got to college to continue to explore and build things, um, I stumbled into education uh, partially because uh, I ended up uh, going to a school that didn't have very many students who looked like me or who came from uh, backgrounds and places like like I did. And so, um, you know, the the part of my Columbia experience where I felt uh, most at home in a given week was actually leaving campus and walking a few blocks north to local middle schools and high schools in Harlem uh, to teach and volunteer. Um, and I think through those experiences running after school robotics programs and uh, SAT math tutoring, I think uh, really developed a true appreciation for uh, the work that that educators can do and, and the impact that that someone can have as an educator. Um, yeah, I think, you know, midway through college kind of took a hard right uh, with my, my my personal sort of career journey and plans and um, decided that this is the work that I wanted to do. And so um, about 11 or 12 years ago, started this nonprofit that I still run today um, with, with engineering classmates from Columbia. And I think that the original goal or vision with our work was to um, try to solve a big problem and make uh, practical uh, high quality science education more accessible to students anywhere. And so for for four years, we developed uh, sort of like a MacGyver science curricula. Um, so, um, you know, designing uh, lessons and labs and activities where people in communities anywhere could recycle materials that you could find in a local market in Ghana or rural Mexico or Jamaica. Uh, and, and run high quality hands-on practical experiments and, and did that through the end of college and, and for my first two years out of school, uh, working with you know, thousands of students in, in four or five different countries. But uh, the real job that I had after graduation, because um, you know, ultimately I had to pay rent and pay the bills, uh, was working for a, another uh, nonprofit in Harlem uh, running a dropout prevention program at what at the time was the lowest performing high school in all of New York City. Um, and I think that for all of this, you know, great and innovative work moving quickly and scaling quickly in communities around the world, I think I had two and a half years to really embed myself at the root of the problem within schools in New York City and understand that um, you know, the greatest impact can really be had through systems level change. Um, and so for the last five to six years, we, we've actually 
um, scaled back on all of our international work with the exception of Ghana, which is you know, still going on 12 years strong, um, but really investing deeply in building innovative school models to help uh, both turn around schools, but also more reliably and more predictably prepare students for post-secondary STEM pathways. I think the hardest thing that I had to do in, in that first job after school um, was sharing an office with a college counselor. And kids would walk into the office every day um, you know, I want to be a doctor, I want to apply to Harvard, I want to be an engineer. And you know, these were students that were graduating high school with no chemistry, with no physics, without even trigonometry, and, and not because the students couldn't do it, but because the schools didn't even offer those classes. Um, and so uh, you know, very, very quickly, um, we began mobilizing curricula resources and eventually building a model to, to help schools address this problem. I noticed that both of you have a Forbes 30 under 30 award in uh, 2016. You know, you got two of the 30 slots. Which one of you went first and told the other person about the opportunities? Um, that's, that's a great- It's funny that Chelsea and I didn't meet each other at that time, but I remember seeing, you know, it's funny. I don't think I ever told you this, Chelsea. I remember seeing you on the list and being like, this guy's really cool. I should reach out to him. <laughs> and then two years later, like we meet each other, you know, through the work that we do. So yeah, everything comes full circle. You guys are doing some really interesting, important projects. How do you keep track of them all? First of all, I mean, how do you know when to jump to another one when you got such, you know, um, so such great experiences working at Ed Surge and other places? I mean, I would die for a week at Ed Surge just just a chance to meet all sorts of people and interview them. You know, um, that's kind of set you up for all sorts of follow ups. Having met the folks you met during those interviews of four years, you've got a Rolodex in your brain of people to contact um for a book for a project for a, you know a team but informal learning came out a couple of times in both of, in one of or both of your discussions but what you seem to be doing isn't exactly informal learning it's like extra formal learning there might be a, have you tried creating a, a a new term that can describe what is engaging for the youth today that isn't necessarily formal learning, that isn't necessarily informal learning, that's somewhat in between the two. Have you thought about that or reflected on it, either one of you? So I, I, I'm not a huge fan of, of the term informal learning. I think that even in an out of school context, all of the work that we do is learning and and oftentimes even the the delivery is 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 actually pretty formal um i i think that uh the relationship between the work that we do in school and and out of school is really symbiotic and and actually you know i think looking at school as a whole the students that i think have the most success are students that become very good at or are very productive at learning in out of school settings. Um, you know, as I think about and reflect on the experiences of of my students and former students, and this goes all the way back to, you know, that that first experience in, in uh, running the dropout prevention program, um, my original job when I was hired was to run the after school program at the school. Um, and they gave me a budget of about $50,000 and said, you know, find some school supports for the students and um, let's figure out how we can, you know, increase attendance, boost graduation rates, et cetera. The challenge was in a school that had eight periods in the day with lunch seventh period, there were no students even in the building for eighth period, let alone after school. Um, and so I think that the inspiration for the work that I do was figuring out how um, we could use the resources that we had for out of school time experiences to enhance what happened in the school day and then use that as the carrot to get kids to stick around for more out of school learning. So, you know, doing things with that cycle. Um, and so I took half of my budget and 
went to all of these teaching artists, whether, you know, uh, spoken word poetry and yoga and arts and photography. And I went to all of the classroom teachers in each of the departments and said, you know, I have this budget that I can't use. I have contracts with these arts agencies. How can we use these resources to enhance what's happening in the classroom? Uh, and so with the entire English department, we developed a poetry unit where the spoken word poet would would come in and if the kids wrote pieces, then they could spend time working with him to perform them in class or out of school. Um, and I think all of these experiences to enhance what happened in the school day then created, I think, an excitement about and connection to learning that could extend beyond three o'clock. And I think as we think about the work that we're doing now with STEM and building models where we can create innovative learning spaces in schools, what happens in the core STEM classes and even elective classes that become compulsory like computer science, it's only a small portion of the work. Um, you know, intentionally connecting students to summer opportunities where um, they can continue learning in the summer and do research at places like MIT or spending eight hours a week in uh, Google's Code Next program where they're learning full stack web development and IoT, but also beginning the college process as 10th graders. All of those things are happening to enhance and accelerate students' journeys in a way that Candidly, there's not enough time or resources in the eight to three o'clock time in schools to, to be able to help students on that journey. Um, so it's an interplay, but it's it's not an either or. It's definitely a yes and. Well, since Mary jo or MJ had mentioned informal learning, do you uh, uh, does your perspective differ from Chelsea's or could you extend it or? I think that my perspective is probably similar to Chelsea's but with maybe a little bit more nuance. So maybe a better way to describe what I see Code Next is doing really well is more embedded learning, you know, the idea of learning by doing. And there are there is capacity for that in both the informal and formal learning space, like Chelsea was saying. But you also mentioned, Chelsea, kind of the limitations of resources and, um, you know, access when it comes to that eight to three year when I was teaching at a charter school, eight to five time period. Um, one dimension that I'll add to it is the policy element, right? So computer science, and I would argue more of these like future of work skill sets are not really um, embedded in any of the expectations from a, um, from a credit hours perspective. There are plenty of states out there that don't require computer science as something you need to graduate from high school. Um, there are also plenty of places out there that don't have the courses provided. So in some respects, I think why, and maybe this is also like me being a recovering formal education <laughs> like teacher, is I gravitated towards the informal space because I wasn't under the same limitations um, that I was when I was a classroom teacher and was required to teach to, you know, the end of the year exam, which, you know, anybody who is, you know, knows education policy and is researched going all the way back to George Bush and, you know, race to the top and all these things knows how much high stakes standardized testing inhibits a lot of that creative use of formal learning time. Um, I'm probably also experiencing a little bit of post-traumatic stress disorder because when I, I was a science teacher and very similar to CS, you know, science, in my opinion, is all about learning by doing. It's about experimentation. It's about trying different things out, you know, taking hypotheses and seeing how they go. Teaching CS is very similar. I would argue all the subjects should be taught similarly, but because in Texas where I was teaching, we were held so strictly to the big end of year standardized test that tested us on the Texas standards known as the tax at the time. That was kind of what the focus was. And I, I have very strong memories of my principal coming in and telling me that for March, April, and May, they were going to cancel all non-history, science, math, and ELA related courses. We were going to do away with the journalism class that I taught, with any sort of CS related stuff, with any art stuff, like it was all focused on that. And so 
you know, when, when stuff like that inhibits you, that's when I think I say, okay, maybe it's going to take informal learning to be the place to test things out. There's fewer limitations. You can be a bit more experimental. You can try different things out and then the kids can bring it back to their formal learning environments and go from there. Um, but I do, I do agree with you, Chelsea, in the sense that like, it's not so much formal versus informal. It's just how can you how can you have embedded learning more in whatever learning situation that you're in? So, I want to quickly jump in and, and piggyback off of off of that point because I think the idea of incentive and accountability for schools to uh, you know have the desire or incentive to prepare students for these pathways is is really interesting and you know sort of reflecting back. 30 or 40 years, the education system, I think that oftentimes school was designed to prepare students for either blue collar or white collar jobs. And, you know, now, as I think industry has evolved quite a bit, um, you know, all of these opportunities in, in tech or this no collar industry have now have now emerged. And um, I think that CTE always played a critical role in helping to prepare students for uh, jobs and careers immediately and right after education. And um, very quickly, there was a shift to um, fill the demand with things like tech boot camps and creating opportunities for career transition. But um, I think where the real opportunity within formal education that exists is uh, in a reinvestment and expansion of CTE programs to immediately prepare students to fill that demand. And, um, you know, the amount of content that you can cover in a six month boot camp versus four years of an integrated CTE computer science pathway is incredible. And the incentive is there for schools when they can tap into CTE and Perkins dollars. Um, one of the ways that we're working with schools in New York City is to address just that. And, um, you know, schools have an ac have the ability and access to tap into uh, significant public dollars to, to be able to um, create these type of pathways early on in high school. So I just want to highlight a couple points that have come out in this discussion and then uh, ask Punya to, to jump in. But one, one th I love Kurt's question, and in the research community, I have talked to people who've said, I'm just going to work in schools. That's my focus. And they've made some progress in schools, but when the kids have no supports in the rest of their lives, that progress is like building a sandcastle and watching the tide come in. And I've talked to more researchers who've said, it's just too hard to work with schools. I'm tired of pushing that stone up the hill. I'm going to work in informal where I can do whatever I want to do without barriers. And that fails as well. You can't write off schools and, and just let in out of school carry the load, especially not for students that are economically marginalized. And so it's, it's got to be both and. And I love the fact that both of you are, are talking about all the parts of the system, the learning system, as opposed to the educational system. The other thing that I heard that really resonated with me, Chelsea, you talked about how many years you've been doing this. MJ, you talked about you know, the years that you've put into your current work. It takes time. It takes time to do something that's truly transformative, that, that brings people along and builds their capacity and makes it sustainable. And I see so many people looking for silver bullets that they can ride in and fire and ride out again. You know, the magic boot camp, the magic this, the magic technology doesn't work. And, and how we incentivize and protect people who are willing to invest that kind of time into going deep, I think is really important. Punya? Thank you, Chris. So just a quick 
couple of comments and I don't know if I have a question. I, I, it's a broader topic I just want to bring up. Um, I think the point of uh, time, I think Chris, just to follow up on what you said, I think is so huge. Um, I work with this huge organization in India and they work in one of the most, they work in some very impoverished sort of states in the country. And in one instance, they talked about it took 10 years before they could get just the needle move a little bit on like student learning and achievement. And I always, you know, and then they were, in fact, one of the head of that organization was at a panel at AERA with all these different foundation heads. And one of the questions asked them, they're like, when do you know that you should leave? You know, that this project is done or whatever. And they said, how can you? Like it took us 10 years to move the needle just a little bit. This is the work we do, we are here and that's it, right? I just thought that was, I think that's sort of interesting to, to bring up. So what I wanted to talk about was the fact that uh, I have a background in engineering as well. So Chelsea, I completely see that sort of move from electrical engineering to design and education. That's been my uh, pathway. And something that I think both of you sort of alluded to, and I think uh, Chelsea, you mentioned, and again, coming back to something that Chris said, is this idea of systems. And I think what both of you are doing, which I think is really interesting, is building new systems, because otherwise you have this distinction between sort of this is the school and this is the outside of school. Here we have the structure, here we have that. While actually the situation, A, needs to be much more fluid because it's not like their learning happens only in one space, but that these two can sort of complement each other. So anyway, those are sort of my quick comments. I wanna move us in a slightly different direction. And again, this is not to push against STEM per se. I mean, I, like I said, I have an undergraduate in engineering. The reason I got into education is because I want, I grew up watching Carl Sagan and well, Jacob Bronowski and just being inspired by the, the elegance and beauty of mathematics and science. I still dabble in that stuff today. However, I wonder what you think about this idea that there is this inordinate emphasis on STEM. And what I mean by that, and I was so glad that both of you sort of mentioned poetry and journalism, right? So clearly you are not coming at it from that perspective, but I want us to little discuss a little bit about that because STEM per se doesn't address questions of value. And, you know, Doug Rushkoff has this essay where he talks about what if Mark Zuckerberg had not dropped out of Harvard and taken a class in philosophy, taken a class in history, taken a class in sociology, had a deeper understanding of human beings and how complex they are and these sort of ebbs and flows of history and, you know, the psychology and, you know, all of that stuff, right? So the, and, you know, and, and you end up with a mantra like move fast and break things or, <clears throat> you know, Google's initial motto, which was do no evil till one fine day, they sort of subtly pushed it out because they realized that the world is a complex place. I mean, this is no ding on Google, right? And that what is right and what is wrong is complicated and what is supportive of, <laughs> you know, no, I mean, I use Google all the time. Here we are using YouTube, right? So, I mean, it's, 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 but the point being, it is complicated that the same YouTube algorithms, which allow people to find these conversations are also the ones which are pushing people into all kinds of weird spaces on the internet. Let's not, you know, no two ways about it. So the question I have is that how does, you know, because I think values and principles and individual moral compass development or as a society, as a school, particularly if we are talking about disadvantaged groups, particularly we are talking about groups that have been marginalized, uh, the kinds of jobs of the future and who gets the high paying jobs and who doesn't. I wonder how these ideas or conceptions play out in the work that you do, or does it like, you know, is that something which you feel at this point in time, the need is much more for developing this next generation workforce and that maybe this is something somebody else will do or that we'll tackle later. I just want to get your perspectives on it. This is like not a question per se, but really, uh, no, I mean, I'd love to hear Chris and Kurt, your takes on it as well, because this is a question that I think about a lot, you know, because if you look at every problem that we have today, it is because we have not factored in who we are as a species. I mean, you just have to look at the all anti-vax and anti-mask and all of that, right? It is not a technological problem, you know? Um, anyway, I've talked on enough. I'd love to hear whoever wants to go first, uh, your thoughts on this, this aspect of STEM and humanities and, you know, being human and all of that. 
I guess I'm I'm happy to go first, but please anybody just and feel free to just like hop in and interrupt because this is something that I I I feel very passionate about mostly because well for a lot of reasons. First off, I was an art major when I was an undergrad. My dad was an architect growing up, so there was always kind of that balance of, you know, left brain, light brain is kind of an archaic terminology, but you know, he loved the art and he loved the mathematical engineering component of it. There seems to be this dichotomy in education where you're either one or the other. You're either on the right side or the left side. You either are a fan of the arts or you're a fan of STEM. Um, it kind of <laughs> harkens back a little bit to the informal versus formal question that Kurt asked earlier, like why is it one or the other? And what's interesting that I've really come to understand through reading through um, the last few years of the World Economic Forum's Future of Jobs report that they put out every three years is how as much as the content of understanding things like cloud computing and data science is truly important, it's also the understanding behind like critical thinking and what you could arguably say are more of like the soft skills, right? And similar to sort of this focus on STEM at the at the risk of losing some of the other subjects, I sense that there's also sometimes way too much of a focus on the hard skills versus, versus the soft skills. And so when I see the work in Code Next that I think is really addressing this, it's all of the interdisciplinary opportunities that we're putting together for the kids that allow them to flex different parts of their interests and their skill sets. So I'll give you a prime example. So two months ago, we had a weekend hackathon with some of our, um, our online program kids who come from 26 different states across the country. And it was it, what, what it's called is breakbeat code. Basically, what you're doing is you're learning how to use EarSketch, which is an online system that um, blends together sort of Java and Python coding to remix different musical beats. So it's almost like, you know, if you were going to take DJing and put it through, you know, kind of a coding transmogrifier, call it what you will. And what was so interesting at the end of it was that one of the girls that we had in our program from Tennessee, she said to me afterwards, it was like, so Machupu, how did it go? And she was like, well, to be honest with you, before I came here, I kind of just thought I was a computer scientist. And now I feel like I can, she said this word for word. She said, now I think I can call myself a co coder artist DJ. And I was like, that's pretty cool. You should put that on your resume. And she was like, yeah, I actually think I'm going to because I sort of feel like it was encouraged for us to do both. And there was a moment there where I thought to myself, why can't more interdisciplinary learning activities be so much more prevalent in our societal expectations of what learning looks like? And so when I think about people, like you said, being so focused and obsessed with funding and supporting STEM education, I understand the logic, but not necessarily the follow through. So those are my thoughts, but I'm curious to hear other folks' thoughts. I can jump in um, Go ahead. and just to sort of restate the question, um, it's that there's an over overemphasis on STEM uh, and that oftentimes applications of STEM education don't always address uh, questions of value. Um, I think that a big part of the problem is how STEM is taught. And I think that so often, and it's not just STEM education, but it's education more generally, things are taught within silos or things are taught without exploring social or cultural context. Um, I think that when I reflect on my own education, uh, I, I had a very privileged education all the way through college. And I think one of the reasons why is because I had uh, you know, as, as early as kindergarten, like transdisciplinary educational experiences where, um, you know, everything is kind of integrated. I, I think that um, those experiences and <laughs> the value of my education was also very expensive. So I, I attended uh, a, a really, uh, really, really incredible independent school in Philadelphia, K through 12. But I never had a class with more than 18 students. Um, and I think that, you know, part of the issue that, that we see within education uh, is an undervaluing of the work that teachers have to do and really the resources that are required 
to make effective educational experiences work. Um, you know, I think that for all of the experiences that I've had doing research, doing internships, reflecting with friends, like being a teacher is actually one of the hardest jobs that anyone can have. And being able to maintain that level consistently for a true eight hours a day, nine months of the year is, is just incredibly demanding. And, and I think that, you know, the models where we've seen where we've been most effective is being able to bring additional resources into schools through public and private partnerships to do things like uh, in our school uh, partners, we, we send in teaching fellows or education fellows that um, provide support two days a week. So if we're doing uh, a hands-on robotics lesson or a biomedical engineering lab, it's not one teacher trying to manage 30 students working on 15 projects, but um, you're able to support students in the way that they need to be supported. Um, I think the other big issue um, or sort of shift that needs to happen is, I think, a greater emphasis on project or competency-based assessments. Um, I think that students often learn best when they're working on things that they're passionate about. And um, we have to be able to create enough space for students to understand a concept and then apply it in ways that are meaningful to them, um, which you know, at the first level boosts engagement when they're learning, but I think also best prepares them for um, using that to innovate and create solutions. So, you know, I think that the most effective learning does take place in transdisciplinary settings, but also like the other key point that I wanna make is that the people that are proximate to the problem are best equipped to solve that problem. Um, and so giving students the tools and then having them reflect on problems within their communities and provide them with support and resources to solve it um, does continue and accelerate their learning because they have that investment. Thank you for saying that, Chelsea, because that mention of project-based and competency-based assessment models is, I, I think, also related to a, a common assumption about STEM education, that it is easier to score, assess, grade. And in many ways, STEM education, as we oftentimes see it now, is only easier to assess in the sense that it's kind of being pushed through this high stakes standardized testing lens. Whereas when, we, when we're running Code Next, I mean, the kids are not taking multiple choice exams. What they're doing is they're creating projects and then doing peer, peer reviews of each other's work and then getting, you know, peer reviews from their coaches. And the amount of feedback that they get is so much more rich and helpful. But like I was saying before, my own experience being a STEM educator was that there is this assumption that math and science are easier to do because you can give the kid a multiple choice exam and then you'll know whether or not they've gotten the material, which I cannot disagree with more. Whereas things like writing, um, you know, reading comprehension are sometimes a bit more complex, supposedly in terms of scoring, because oftentimes there's more of a, um, you know, a review, a review process that has to happen. But frankly, my overarching feeling is that we should always be doing the competency and project-based assessment model that Chelsea is talking about. It just takes a lot more time and is oftentimes a lot more complicated. And that goes back really to one of the themes of this conversation, which is resource constraints and the fact that teachers shouldn't necessarily have to be spending their entire Saturday and Sunday grading. But when I tell you that my memories from my Saturdays and Sundays are of me going to Corner Bakery sitting down for six hours and grading all of the science projects my kids did, oof, that's exactly what it was. So, Punya, I, I loved your question as well. I, I love my co-hosts because they ask wonderful questions. And um, it's taken me a long time to figure this out in my own life, but I think what 
the most foundational thing that education should be doing from the very beginning is helping each child to understand what should I do with my life and why, which is not STEM. That's humanities, philosophy, ethics, and so on. And then you ask, how? How do I do that? Well, that's STEM. You know, that's a lot of what we actually teach in schools. But teaching the how without the why gives us, you know, the world that we're living in now, which which has a lot of problems precisely because of that. I also think that that you know we have the wrong role models. Uh, I did my undergraduate work at Caltech. Now I teach at Harvard. Veritas, truth, right? What's the ultimate achievement? Winning the Nobel Prize. Uh, not really, no, you know, I don't think the purpose of life is, is to find truth. Uh, I think if you want to make the purpose of your life finding truth, fine, but let's not set that up as the universal purpose for everybody's life. And, and, and that's often what our education system does. So I just um, think that this question about STEM being instrumental as opposed to a goal in and of itself is is really important to convey to kids. Um, Kurt, do you want to jump in on this? I do. And I think it's slightly different, but really not too different. We've got two people with us today, uh, Punya and Chris and Young, who's handling YouTube channel, who've done a lot in a short amount of time. And I, I'm going to ask them to describe maybe or tell us four or five things that they did along the way that got them to the position that they are. Because we're going to have a number of classes using this these videos, my class included. I just introduced it today to my students. They're all going to be watching these. And they're going to learn from these. So, uh, they can pick whatever ones they want. But I, you know, I want them to pick this one. It's a really good one. And so um, I would like each of you to, to describe what, what tips or advice would you have for young people who are master's students, who are maybe undergraduate students, who are doctoral students that will help jumpstart their careers. And I'll, I'm gonna add to that three things for each of you, separate things. If um, MJ, you could possibly mention either what it's, what Ed Surge is so that these students can, and they probably don't even know what Ed Surge is, uh, the power, and Chris reads it a lot and I read it a lot. Can you can tell, tell them what that is? Or, and or tell them what Scratch Ed is. I have a student doing a dissertation on Scratch Ed right now. So, and, and many others do not know about it. Or um, match charter schools. If you could tell them about one of those three things in your answer, it'd be good. And Chelsea, in your answer, if you could tell people about what it's like being on the board of Girls Be Heard, what it's like to be a speaking ambassador for the US State Department, um, US Department of State, I should say, or what it's like to meet Barack Obama. Uh, <laughs> if you could comment on one of those three in your answer, it might help flavor it and give some context to what you're saying. So pick any one of those things, but I really want you talking about your careers, your early career people, and you've been very, very successful. And, and, and in effect, you're going to be mentoring the folks who are watching these uh, this, this session later on. Well, now I want Chelsea. <laughs> I feel like I can't follow <laughs> Chelsea. <laughs> so I feel like, Chelsea, you should go first, especially if you share the Barack Obama meeting story, because then I, I don't know what I'm going to say. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm actually going to. Uh, I think that I'll, I'll I'll actually talk about the the work um, uh, that I've done to support the organization Girl Be Heard um, because I think that um, you know one of the things that's made our work so unique over the years in STEM education is the representation of young women in our programs. So even in in New York, in our out of school time programs where where things are you know open and accessible to anyone. Uh, we're still 60% female. Um, and the girls are, for the large part, actually outperforming the boys. Um, 
I think, you know, the, the question uh, that you asked in, in the beginning, though, like, uh, what have I done that got me to where I am, which is a long way of answering or addressing that that last point about gender equity, um, is that constantly learning and constantly iterating and um, not being afraid to try new things, but always reflecting on both qualitative and quantitative data from each of our programs or activities. Um, and so, as I mentioned, we started working internationally and, um, you know, we've been running these like hands-on intensive summer camps in Ghana for about 12 years. And probably seven years ago, uh, we made a shift to uh, creating residential programs. And in the first year, I think we, uh, you know, we, we started small, we might have had maybe 30 students, but there were only five girls that first year. And immediately, the question was, you know, what's the issue? How can we get more girls? How are we marketing and presenting the program? Um, and this is actually our first engagement with Google, we got a grant from uh, Google in 2013 with the Google Rise Award. And partnered with a Nigerian-based organization called WOW Foundation, working to advance African women. And we worked really closely with them uh, to understand how to create supportive environments for girls. Um, and the very next year, we partnered with WOW and we put together computer science and STEM camps for girls in probably seven or eight different African countries to um, teach everything from scratch to Arduino and embedded computing. And I think that experience, me understanding and learning closely with an organization that um, really had developed best practices to support that population was super important. Um, the next year when we went back to Ghana to run our camp and evaluated the, uh, the, the application question surveys, we saw that um, in the question that asked about career ambitions, the majority of the girls in Ghana wrote about wanting to help people. They wrote about wanting to be doctors or nurses. Um, and I think we were able to capitalize off of that and the very next year brand our camp as a computer science and biomedical engineering camp. And the number of applicants skyrocketed just because there was an opportunity for girls to think about uh, applying this inherent interest in medicine or wanting to help people, at least the way that that was most prevalent to them, uh, to science and engineering education. And of course, biomedical is just, you know, engineering with the applications of the human body. And so the whole curriculum was still computer science and electrical engineering and, you know, uh, designing diagnostic devices and things. But, you know, all of those experiences helped us to do better. So, we do make it a point to make sure that we have female instructors in all of our classes. We do make it a point to um, create support systems when we're recruiting girls. Um, and, you know, there's, there's so many, this could be a whole nother conversation, um, but I do think that making sure that we're being intentional about designing educational experiences in a way where all students have a sense of belonging um, is, is critically important to success. So what's interesting about what you just said, Chelsea, is that the when I was thinking about sort of my own experiences in graduate school, I know that a major part of what led me to where I am is this concept of social capital. And, you know, people have different definitions, but what Code Next tends to define tech social capital as especially is, um, you know, the networks of relationships that you have that sustain you throughout your life and can carry you through your career development. Um, and the question that you asked earlier, Kurt, about sort of my own experiences at, um, in, you know, or how graduate students can navigate the space that they're in right now, I think back honestly to when I was at Harvard and I met Karen Brennan, who is one of Chris Didi's colleagues. Um, she was a very new professor at the time, but knew that I was interested in pursuing, you know, various opportunities in the ed tech space and introduced me who, to Karen Cater, who at the time was the head of the office of ed tech for the US government. And so 
by that connection and by my relationship with Karen connecting me to this other person, that then started a chain of events, which now leads me to where I am today, because they introduced me to Betsy, who was the founder of EdSurge. EdSurge was, still is, um, I kind of affectionately call it the tech crunch of education, but if you don't know what tech crunch is, it's basically the most well-known um, editorial site when it comes to um, education technology, who uses it, who funds it, um, policy around it, it, both in higher education and K-12, and in some cases, um, post higher ed. Um, but I didn't really have any experience as a writer. I was an educator though. And at the time, Betsy was looking for educators to join the team. She knew that she could train them as writers, but she needed the experience. And, you know, when I think about what the best use of grad school was for, in my opinion, other than just learning the interesting content, the people that I met basically led me to where I am today. And there's so much about what I think Codenext intends to do that sees that as well, because one of my colleagues right now, Shamika, is working on a uh, piece of research that we did in tandem with EDC, the Education Development Center, which is also in Massachusetts, um, around the important role that social capital plays in navigating the computing education ecosystem for young Black girls um, and how much those peer relationships don't foster a sense of competition, but rather camaraderie and can carry them throughout um, their career development. So there's this interesting mirroring between what Chelsea was saying, but also what I've experienced in my own world, which is the networks that you have, I consider to be nearly as vital as, if not more vital than the hard and soft skills that I developed through my education career, because the relationships were basically what led me to my job both the one that I have now and the one that I had before this. Kurt, do you have a comment? Yeah, if I can unmute myself, I will. <laughs> and I agree with you, MJ. You know, I had a class this morning with two female role models in, in academia from the University of North Texas for my master's and doctoral students. You know, and it was the first class brought them, you know, brought them in for a chat. And so it's the networks that we expose people to. And, you working at Ed Surge were definitely brought into a unique environment in, in that you're able to see what's going on before it actually happens in some cases. You know, when I did my book, The World is Open, it was all about, you know, my whether I was going to have the courage to contact somebody out there. And by you working at Ed Surge, it forces you to have that little that 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 courage to contact a bunch. You got to get your story done and so forth. And you know, and now you have those um, people that you can tap into or you know give feedback to. Now Jeffrey Young, for instance, is a good friend of mine for a long time. So um, I didn't know Jeff. That's so funny. Yeah, he calls me when he needs a story on on uh, the Arab world, I think, uh, or whatever. Oh. Um, <laughs> since I I tap into that. Um, so you know. So people like Jeffrey Young or Joshua Kim from Inside Higher Ed, the, the point I'm going to make is for people watching the show later, Ed Search is one place you can go to. Inside Higher Ed is another place. Read Joshua Kim or um, read uh, the, the Chronicle. Try and subscribe to the, or The Guardian or wherever. Um, try and have a couple places that you can go to on a, on a daily basis quickly, you know, at whatever time that can keep you abreast of the field because it's changing fast. Um, and these resources are out there that are free. And, and so why not, uh, you know, uh, keep up to date in some whatever way that you find um, valuable and effective and inspirational for you. So that's why I, I really, you know, um, have enjoyed this conversation today with both of you, because um, you've informed me about a number of things I need to follow up on. Uh, Chris? Well, I, I want to comment on the fact that we have one fifteenth of the 30 people under 30 to watch or whatever that was titled. Um, I see a lot of, of a list like that. And often I'm kind of appalled by the people can I make who a are. Quick, can I make yes, a quick comment? Chris? I'm sorry to interrupt, but honestly, the Forbes list is literally the most egregious example of the social capital closed networks at work. Because, and I mean, I might be, like honestly angry in the entire Forbes editorial staff when I say this, but I've written about it, so I don't really feel bad. But like the way that I got 
I think I got on the list was because people who had been on the list the year prior nominated me and people who have been on the list the year prior have greater weight than just strangers. And it's just kind of, there was a piece of research actually, I'll need to find it, but that took the last like five year period, I think it was between 2019 and 2013 or 2014 and mapped out how all those folks were kind of connected. And they found that most of the people on the list had some sort of career or university or some sort of like connection between them. So like, I, I still think, Chelsea, you're still amazing. Like you're fabulous, don't ever change. Um, but I will say that even things like that, there is oftentimes some sort of network story behind the scenes. So anyway, sorry, I'll send it back to you. No, I agree with you. And, and uh, I am often appalled by the people who are on the list. Uh, because it's the wrong model for leadership. But this episode shows me why I'm so happy that the two of you are on this particular list. Even, even if you may have gotten there through, through uh, you know, not a full consideration of all the multiple dimensions, because I think that somebody who's truly a leader is not somebody necessarily who's risen high in a command and control structure. And so they can say, well, I'm a leader because I give orders to a lot of people or, or somebody who's a leader um, because they um, you know, have, have founded six corporations or uh, you know, made a huge amount of money uh, or, or gotten a lot of people to vote for them. I think that leaders, the true leader is somebody when you meet them and you interact with them, you say, I wish I was like them. I wish I was like them. I wish, uh, you know, the two of you in today have, have illustrated for me, once again, the power of modeling. And I think that a lot of the impact that you have is not only the great things that you say and do, but the great things that you model for people of every age that you're trying to influence. And so I'm, I'm just really happy with our discussion and, and with the kind of insights that you bring. And I, I hope that you will continue uh, doing the great work that you are doing, even if, you know, the you, you may not make the 40 people to watch under 40 <laughs> or whatever, you know, the new uh, elite category system is going to be. So, uh, Punya, do you have any closing comment before we go to Kurt to talk about next week? Yeah, I, I think we're short on time. I just wanted to uh, briefly sort of emphasize, Chelsea, something you said, which is this idea of transdisciplinary education. And I think that that is such a critical thing that I wish we had a more sort of a robust way of talking about that within our sort of educational system, because, you know, we will do interdisciplinary and we'll do multidisciplinary, but transdisciplinary to me really gets to sort of ways of thinking and mindsets which cut across the disciplines. You know, and I think the example that you gave of the programmer, DJ, you know, uh, I'm forgetting the third category. Um, that's Right. And I think those are the kinds of spaces that really, and if you think economically where the growth happens, it actually happens in the application of technology to entertainment. It happens in the application of technology to other domains. And so it's only then I think that the real power of the kind of work uh, that you guys are espousing can, will emerge. So I, I was just wanted to make a comment that I was very happy that you mentioned that because that's an area of, I've written about it, you know, uh, and, and so on. So it was this nice to hear that approach and perspective. And with that, I'll pass it, I think, on to Kurt to introduce. And again, uh, thank you both of you for joining us today. This was uh, a great fun. Kurt, on to you. We only have a 30 second wrap up and we have another 30 seconds. So um, Chelsea, you wanna, you wanna uh, see a final uh, comment here? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think in reflecting on on the conversation uh, from today as a whole, I I am I think incredibly excited by uh, this platform and the opportunity to share some of these thoughts. I think you know separately and and offline we're we're sort of commenting on the, through our own chat about 
uh, being able to create more platforms to share ideas for things like how to hack the Forbes list. Um, I, I think that there, there are a lot of things that, that, that can and should be shared. And so hopefully, um, you know, this is just the first of, of many conversations, but, um, you know, I think that in life, in education, like the engineer in me thinks in processes and whether it's making it onto the Forbes list or helping a student learn algebra, it's, I, I look at every problem by looking at all of the different inputs and parameters and then trying to work through towards a solution. And the work that we're doing in building a scalable model to reliably and predictably move students into post-secondary pathways is, is interesting because there are so many variables, environment, size, location. Um, and I think the big question that we're wrestling with and, and will continue to explore is like, what's the loose and what's the tight within that model? And, you know, what are the components that stick and, and are, um, you know, uh, consistent across different schools or learning environments? And what are the pieces that, that have to adjust or adapt? So um, yep. thank you again for this platform. And I'd love to talk more about that. So next week, we'll have people from Costa Rica talking about whether their model is scalable or not. We're going to have, a, it's titled, uh, In Search of Brighter Days with Night High Schools in Costa Rica. Two faculty from the University of Costa Rica, one also works for the Ministry of Education in Costa Rica. They work with women who haven't gotten their high school degree, but they're factory workers, they're selling fruit and fruit stands, they're cleaning houses, they're picking coffee, and um, they're getting them an education at nights. So it should be a real interesting show. Natalie and Hanya will be with us for that show. I want to thank you all for coming for this one and we'll see you next week.